Welcome KringleCon attendees to HTTP2 because 1 is in fact the loneliest number. My name is Chris Elgy. I work at Counterhack Challenges, building things and breaking things. I'm also in the Army National Guard. I am on the Twitters. I have too many E's in my last name, some certs, and a singing Justin Bieber toothbrush. Chris Davis and I are going to talk to you today about HTTP 1.1 and 2.0 and some of the differences there because it's 2.0 is a technology that most of us are less familiar with. Uh, but it's really pervasive, and, and we'll look at that going forward. Um, so each created about 18 years apart um, and, and kind of preceded by HTTP.9 and 1.0, uh, but really .9.1 and, and 1.1 aren't, aren't terribly different, uh, at least in terms of the, uh, the aspects we're going to look at today. So with 1.1 um, and 2.0, they're both going to be available in, in any browser you're using, Safari, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, whatever they will speak uh, both of these technologies. Now with 1.1, our headers are all ASCII. They're all human readable. Uh, each header is a line of code, or a line of ASCII text, where with 2.0, it's all bytecodes. It's binary. Um, so we're, we're not able to read it anymore, but, uh, but it's computers talking to computers so that they can be a little more uh, compact in how they communicate. So that, that saves a little bit of, uh, of overhead there. Also with 1.1, it, it's really a connectionless technology. Uh, your your client, your web browser, asks for one file at a time and gets it back from the web server one one file at a time. Uh, where with 2.0, it's it is connection oriented. You'll, we'll see the term stream pop up a few times uh, to where um, basically a web server can send a bunch of files at once with a single TCP handshake uh, and a single teardown at the end. With 1.1, we do still have some unencrypted, just regular HTTP websites, uh, but of course, most things we're, we're doing anything sensitive on uh, are going to be TLS, and that's you know your social media, your email, uh, or whatever. With, with 2.0, the RFC actually allows for an unencrypted HTTP2 connection, but no browser will speak it. Uh, really, the only tool I've found that will, that will speak unencrypted 2.0 is curl, um, and we'll, we'll play with that here in a little bit. And uh, finally, with 1.1, that's, that's absolutely totally available in any web server you're going to go to. Um, you really have to have to contrive an instance where, it, where it, that wouldn't be available. Whereas with 2.0, it isn't completely available uh, across the entire internet. But with any top site, with most top sites, uh, it's going to be up. So uh, if we look at the top Alexa sites that fit on my slide, all but three are speaking 2.0 already. And if you think about it from the perspective of these major providers, uh, there, there's a cost savings there, right? With, with these binary headers with, with fewer TCP handshakes and teardowns, there, there are a few fewer bytes in each transaction for a user, uh, which when you're dealing on the scale of these type of, uh, of systems, then that could be a significant cost savings in, in terms of network infrastructure. So, uh, pictorially, we can we can sort of think of it this way, where with 1.1, we would request a URL like slash or index, and then we would get that HTML file back from the server. And then that since that file referenced a JavaScript uh, a script that needs to be added, then we request it, and we get it back. It references an image, we request it, we, we get it back, maybe some CSS, request it, get it back. All is individual uh, connections with a three-way handshake, uh, the push of the file, and then the four-way teardown. With 2.0, it is it is simpler. It's a little more uh, kind of fancy in how it does things, but but there's a single request for slash or index, and then the server can send back all the files that are necessary in a single push. So uh, again, less less overhead uh, in terms of network traffic. To look at it a bit uh, lower level, let's kind of dive into curl here a bit. So we've got here just curl, or give me a website dash v for verbose. Without this, curl would just return the HTML or whatever content comes back from the server. It wouldn't tell us what's going on kind of under the hood. I'm then, then going to specify dash dash HTTP2 because I want to talk HTTP2 because that's what this talk is about. Then we're going to give it a specific URL, HTTPS colon slash slash www.baidu.com slash. That's the website I want. Then I'm going to do this little shorthand for put standard error into standard out. Uh, I'm going to do this because uh, in order to show this one screen at a time, I'm going to pipe standard out through the command less. Without putting standard error into standard out, uh, we wouldn't be able to see 
the um, the information that curl is going to give us about the handshake stuff. Uh, when we curl verbosely, we get the TLS handshake information and and all that all that connection uh, errata in standard error. So if we didn't put it into standard out, then it would it would fly by and wouldn't get caught by the less command. So uh, that's just a little shorthand there again to to combine standard error and standard out. So off we go. Our browser curl uh, goes ahead and reaches out to Baidu and then. Uh, offers up a couple different uh, connection methods using application layer protocol negotiation or ALPN. It's offering H2, which is just shorthand for HTTP2, as you might guess, and then also 1.1. And then goes forward uh, and, and kind of finishes the TLS handshake. Now notice that these uh, these offerings, the, the 2 and the 1.1, these happen as part of the TLS handshake. This is this is before any GET request or anything like that. Uh, this is while they're still determining how they want to speak securely. So, uh, so those are the offers. The Baidu server comes back, says, great, let's talk 1.1, some certificate information. And then here, curl is showing us uh, the regular ASCII requests that we're used to seeing, right? As web app pen testers, we're used to the get and the slash and, and all this, the host, uh, the user agent, which of course here is curl, and then uh, give me back anything, uh, any type of data. And then the web server responds with a, a typical ASCII header of 200 OK, uh, here's some stuff that's coming at you. Uh, I don't cache things. Here's a cookie, so I can so I can track your uh, status as we go through. And then, of course, after that comes uh, the HTML. Now it's going to look similar with uh, with Google. We're going to offer HTTP two and one dot one. We'll complete our TLS handshake certificates. And then uh, Google says, hey, let's talk HTTP2, right? I want to save that little bit of overhead, uh, and you're able to talk it, so here we go. Now, this GET request looks a little funny, right? Because we're talking two. We asked for two, we got two uh, back, and, and here's our header requesting 1.1. I think what happened here with curl is that um, it knows we want to see an ASCII header because we gave it the dash V for verbose. Uh, but of course, there are no ASCII headers, so it's got to make something up just just for these uh, for these human eyes looking at it. Uh, so it just sort of defaults to showing get slash HTTP 1.1, even though this really is a 2.0 request. And we can see that in the response from Google HTTP slash 2 200. Uh, this is an OK, and of course, this is actually coming back and forth as, as byte codes, but um, kind of kind of abstracting as as ASCII for us for us humans. So we see that response. Uh, maybe some headers we're less used to seeing. Uh, it's still setting some cookies, right? Because Google's still going to track certain things. Uh, and then looking farther down, we get the uh, the HTML coming back from Google. So uh, there we have it. Uh, just HTTP2 at a at a high level. And uh, now Chris Davis will talk more about looking at the traffic in depth and decoding it in Wireshark. Hey, my name is Chris Davis. I'm going to show you how to decrypt and analyze HP2 traffic in Wireshark. So the tools that we're going to be using for this is Wireshark, uh, Chrome, and Curl. Wireshark does the traffic analysis and the decryption piece, while uh, Chrome and Curl allow you to store SSL keys to be able to decrypt. Uh, the benefit of Chrome is you can interact with the website. Uh, you can use things like developer tools, which makes uh, interacting with the website a lot easier. Uh, curl obviously can be used to help automate command line interaction. Uh, again, you can script things up, like maybe you had an API that uh, was HP2 enabled and you needed to automate a, a task, uh, and but also store the SSL keys for debugging later. Uh, this is, you would use curl for that. Uh, so why do we want to use these? Unfortunately, because there's not a lot of HP2 support and a lot of common tools and frameworks right now. Uh, for example, one of my favorites is Python requests. Uh, it does not have HP2 support as of the time of writing this, unfortunately. So I wanted to quickly show you, uh, or at least give you the commands you need to build curl with HP2 and SSL support because at least on Ubuntu 16.04, which is what I use, I found that curl did not have HP2 support built in. Uh, so I had to go through and I had to uh, rebuild it myself. I had to remove and then rebuild it myself. So these were the commands that I had used to, to be able to accomplish that. It also requires curl 7.59 or greater to be able to do HP2. Also to be able to uh, store the SSL key logs as well. So I had to build that with that support built in too. Otherwise you can't uh, pass the SSL key log environment variable. 
So going back to what I was just saying, the ESL key log file can be specified when we run our curl command, uh, in which case we can we just give it the environment variable equals uh, SSL key logs about text, and that's just an arbitrary flat file, text file location that you want to specify. Uh, again, and then curl and whatever curl commands and parameters you want to pass it, including the URL of the HTTP2 enabled server. Uh, again, when you do that, it saves that those SSL keys so that we can decrypt it in Wireshark later. So for the demo here, I'm going to show you how to use Chrome to actually store those SSL key logs so that we can uh, decrypt them with Wireshark. So here, again, I'm using this on Windows, but I believe the same can be done with actually Firefox uh, and Chromium on Linux as well. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what those command lines would be, but uh, I'm going to use incognito, the dash dash SSL key log file path. And again, I'm just specifying, specifying a flat text file on my desktop, and then I'm passing in the parameter of my local uh, HP2 enabled web server. Before I move on though, I wanted to show you a couple quick uh, Wireshark filters. So Wireshark is nice in that it does have Wireshark filters built in for HTTP2 now, uh, which makes things really easy, right? For example, we could do HTTP2.headers.method uh, equals get. If we wanted to get just HTTP2, we could type in just HTTP2. We can specify a path. For example, if we were going to grab, we wanted to see uh, styles.css, we could specify the path. We could also specify a cookie. For example, maybe we were uh, trying to debug users' login interaction. We, we needed to see what kind of cookies they were getting. We could specify that. Uh, additionally, uh, if we wanted to see just the data itself, we could do hp2data.data. And then we could uh, also search inside of hp2 for arbitrary uh, values, for example, username, right? So if there's a username a form field and a password form field, we could do HP2 contains and then username, and then it would uh, Wireshark smart enough to be able to parse through HP2 and then find that traffic for us. Okay, let's uh, move on to the demo. I'm going to show you how to capture traffic and then decrypt it with Wireshark and use Google Chrome to store those keys. So first thing we want to do is set a, a traffic capture. I'm using raw cap since. By default, Wireshark is unable to sniff localhost on Windows machines. They can on Linux, but not on Windows. All right, well, let me close that. And then uh, finally, we need to open up command prompt and we need to start Chrome with the SSL key log argument. Okay, so uh, there's our HP2 enabled web interface running on localhost that we opened up with command prompt. And as you can see, we actually have our SSL client random keys here. So it is actually already storing it thanks to Chrome. Uh, we open up Chrome and we can inspect the traffic here on the website and we can do a network capture. And let's just type something in, right? So uh, at this point, maybe you're a pen tester and you're trying to analyze a web form login, right? Maybe you're trying to hack it, you're trying to figure out what's going on with it. Uh, or maybe you're a web developer and there's an error or you're trying to uh, store those keys or, or you know be able to, to to debug what's going on with the web application. So in this case, um, let's just say we're trying to log in. It doesn't really matter what we type in here, but let's go ahead and generate some traffic. Uh, and Chrome actually sees this as the H2 protocol. Um, and it's able to interact with it. And so we can see that it's actually making a login request and we can see our response even here. Uh, but that's it, that's all we needed to do. So we created some traffic. Let's go ahead and close our web server. Let's make sure our keys, yep, so there's some more keys for each of those requests that we made. And then uh, let's go ahead and close our traffic capture. And then we're going to open up our PCAP. Let her open. Okay, so the first thing we're going to notice is that all it sees is SSL traffic, right? Um, it sees the, the, the certificate exchange, right? Um, and it can't really do anything with it, right? Um, it does see that it's port 4433, which is the web server that we had set up. But again, it can't evaluate as HP2 because it's all encrypted. So what we can do is Wireshark actually gives us the option to provide it an SSL keylog file, the one that we just created, uh, in which case it can decrypt the traffic and then we can evaluate it, evaluate it as HP2. Uh, so what we want to do is you want to go to edit and we want to go down to preferences and then once we open up preferences we want to click on the protocols tree and then we want to go down to ssl should be in here somewhere oh, here's ssl uh, under the pre-master secret log file name we want to open that up and we want to specify the ssl key log file that we had created uh, when we do that, we can actually see immediately that some of the traffic was decrypted. So let's go ahead and go back over to our, our Wireshark filters that we provided earlier. Uh, so uh, fortunately, Wireshark knows how to evaluate HP2. 
So HTTP2 is the filter we type in, and when we do that, we can automatically see all of the HTTP2 traffic. Uh, now, one thing to note is there's uh, you can see that the TCP stream number is the same for the entire session. The entire session uh, is one TCP stream, and that's the uh, the performance benefit over HTTP 1.1 because before HTTP 1.1, uh, would every time it needed a resource from the server, it would have to reestablish the TCP handshake and create a new TCP stream. Um, request the resource, get back the response, and then close the TCP stream. For example, if it was getting index.html, then that HTML would have an image in it, it would have JavaScript in it, it would have all of those things. Each and every single one of those would have to be its own separate uh, TCP request. And we can actually see in here that uh, it's doing the same thing, it's doing the same core concept, it's grabbing uh, styles.css, it's, it's uh, making post requests to slash API slash login, it's making uh, it's grabbing some JavaScript files, but each and every single one of those is done under one TCP stream instead of many TCP streams. So uh, just looking at here, um, we can actually go down to where we had done the post API login, and we can actually open up the packet here, and Wireshark has already evaluated it. It's already parsed all of the, the HP2 headers, and it's provided to us uh, in a nice little graphical interface. We can actually select, uh, just like any other protocol analysis in w or Wireshark, we can actually select that value, and we can apply it as a filter, and it'll automatically apply that for us. So if we did HP2 dot header dot value equals post, uh, it gives us all of our post requests, which are the, 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 the five requests that we had made previously. Additionally, HP2 has lots of filters. So if we do type in HP2 and then a period, uh, we'll actually see Wireshark will populate a bunch of filters here for us, right? Header values, flag values, data values. Um, it's, it's smart enough to be able to uh, parse HTTP2 and uh, make your life a little bit easier. So, okay, so we, we wanted to evaluate the, the post login, right? So as we can see here, HP2 has all of our header values. So we have a post, all of these things here. But again, I think what we're interested in is the username and the password form field data. And as we can see here, that's nowhere to be found. Uh, it's actually not in this packet. So let's take a look here because of the way that HP2 works. Uh, frame number, let's start with this packet here. So 2450, so frame dot number is greater than or equal to 2450. So we see here that the post request from the client is made for API slash login. And then in another packet, in a data packet down further, we actually have the post parameters being sent. And so we could actually do, this is where we got that other filter here that I was specifying before. Uh, HP data dot data, and if we type that in, we can actually see just the data requests, right, uh, to the server and from the server data requests. Uh, okay, so now we're interested in the username form field, so we can do HP two data data and ampersand ampersand HP two contains. Now the contains feature says uh, take this protocol. I want to find only inside of these protocols, which would be HP two. I want to find this value, right, and so we're specifying username. If we do that, we can actually see, again, just the data that has the username form field value in it. And uh, here we can, again, we can see our, our username and our password. And again, this would come in handy because maybe we're trying to figure out what the, the client-side web application is doing to the data before it, it's sent to the server, right? And maybe that'll help us either in a pen test or maybe that'll help us in debugging our application. Again, another useful one that I just want to point out, I don't think is applicable to this demo, but uh, HP headers that set to cookie, right? Um, so we can actually parse out cookie values that way. Um, finally, the only thing I wanted to point out as well is uh, when even after it's been decrypted, unfortunately, we can't just do uh, right click follow TCP stream because when we do that, it just sees it as that SSL value, so unfortunately, which is just not super helpful. It was, if it was HP 1.1 and it was, you know, HTTP without, H, without SSL, uh, we could actually right click and view that stream and then see it in plain text. Uh, again, unfortunately, Wireshark does not do that, so it's not completely perfect. Finally, uh, it, it will also not allow us to export HTTP2 objects, right? So when we needed that uh, index.html or that specific JavaScript file, we can't export it uh, through here. We can't do export objects. HTTP, unfortunately, just doesn't show it because it's looking for the HTTP protocol, not HTTP2. 
Chris, thanks so much for that deep dive into the protocol. Uh, I think it's great for people to be able to pull apart HTTP2 and Wireshark and analyze it. You never know when that kind of skill might come in handy. If there are no questions, uh, thanks so much. Feel free to hit us up on Twitter and enjoy the rest of the con.